Thanks for the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zhuo Zhang, and I'm from Purdue University. Today, I'm going to present our research work about counterattacking smart contract exploit. So before we start, I want to introduce a recent attack against the Curve Finance. The Curve Finance is one of the most important decentralized exchange platform on the Ethereum blockchain. However, it was hacked for around 61 million USD dollars in just last week. So what happened there? The source code of the Curve Finance is written in Viper, another smart contract programming language other than Solidity. The code has gone through extensive security auditings, which we can conclu conclude, although not 100% correct, the source code is safe. However, there is a deep bug in the Viper compiler, which may, will make the generated or the compiled EVM bytecode vulnerable. A malicious user, or we call it an attacker, observes these vulnerabilities, and he immediately initiates an attacking transaction. However, due to the nature of the blockchain, before being finalized, any transaction will be pending in a public available pool, which we call the memory pool. It means, at this point, although the attacking transaction has not taken effect, anybody can observe this transaction and locally e e emulate this transaction. So this one also includes an, uh, uh, an arbitrage bot. So the bot realizes this transaction can bring a huge amount of profit to the sender. So the bot tries to synthesize one or a set of transactions that will mimic the original behavior and send the profit to the, to the bot owner. After that, those synthesized transactions are sent to the memory pool as well, but it provides a higher gas tip or gas fee. Due to the higher gas fee, those synthesized transactions take effect first, which means it is the bot which launches the attack and gets the profit. As a result, the original attacking transaction failed. This is typically a process which we call front running. After that, the bot owner realized, well, it is not an arbitrage. It is an attack. So he broadcast to the blockchain and mentioned that he is willing to return the fund. The Curve Finance developer immediately contacted the bot owner and get the fund returned, which is around 5.4 million USD dollars, I think. So what can we learn from this, this curve attack? First of all, many vulnerabilities remain hidden while a lot of security auditing effort has been put into record the bug in the Viper compiler. No one can guarantee there is no bug or no weakness in the whole supply chain. On the other hand, besides security auditing, front-running attacking transaction seems to provide another opportunity to protect the user's funds. So based on the two takeaways from the curve attack, here we present the goal of counterattack and its development timeline. Given a pending attacking transaction, counterattack try to synthesize one or more transactions that will mimic the original attack, but will get the profit to ourselves. It is not a new concept. Back to 2021, a Twitter user proposed a similar idea, but it's, it is not 100% the same. One year after, BlockSec, a well-known DeFi security company, successfully prevented a real-world attack, rescuing around 3.8 million USD dollars in 2023. Many well-known DeFi security companies are trying to develop such a protection mechanism. While despite such effort, the underlying technique remains unknown to the public. So here we present our solution named String, Steam. The overall process is split into three phases, including attack information identification, counter attack synthesis, and execution and validation. We will use a running example to demonstrate the idea. On the left hand side, we show the source code of a vulnerable contract where there are two functions. Function set operators let the owner to set the operator of the smart contract. 
and the emergency exit function allows the operator to transfer the funds out at an emergent situation. However, there is a bug in the vulnerable contract. That is, the set, op set operator function which should be privileged. However, the developer forget to add a sys control. As a result, the attacker can invoke this function to set himself or another malicious entity as the operator and invoke the exit, emergency exit function to get the fund. On the right hand side, we show a case of exploit. Well, there are three transactions in total. The first transaction deploys the exploit contract. And the second transaction set the operator of the victim contract as the uh, set the exploit contract as the operator of the victim contract. And the last transaction, let the exploit contract invoke the emergency exit function to get the fund from the victim contract to the attacker. The first phase of our technique is to do attack information identification. The goal is to pinpoint all attack related malicious entities, including accounts and transactions. So in this, in this case, we have two malicious accounts, that is the attacker and the exploit contract. We also have three related transactions, that is transactions one, two, three. Intuitively, the overall process is performed in an iterative, in an iterative fashion, that is, with newly detected transaction, we try to detect, it, detect more related accounts and vice versa. At the very beginning, the attacking transaction is detected based on the profit. So in this case, the third transaction will be pinpointed as the attacking transaction because it generates a huge amount of profit to the attacker. After that, we will try to investigate all the accounts that are related to the third transaction. So accounts are pinpointed based on historical behaviors. In this case, we have three accounts the attacker, the exploit contract, and the victim contract. So it is easy for us to tell that the attacker is malicious because it is the message sender of the attacking transaction. However, for the exploit contract and the victim contract, it is hard to tell which one is malicious and which one is benign, only based on the information in the third transaction. To help with that, we propose a set of indicators. For example, we have an indicator named as lifespan, which is the duration between the contract deployment time and the attacking time. The intuition here is like the attackers tend to launch the attack as soon as possible in case there is another attacker jump in. We also have an interesting indicator named as source code. That means if the contract has verified source code on the ether scan, this contract is likely benign. But note that all those indicators are not deterministic, which means they may be wrong. So we have a waiting algorithm to aggregate all the hint. With the help of those hint, we can tell the exploit contract is the malicious one and the victim contract is the benign one. After that, we need to investigate all the transactions, all the historical transactions sent from malicious entities. So the transactions are pinpointed by read and write dependence. Here we have two transactions needed to investigate. The first one is the deploy transaction, which is of course related to this attack because it is the deployment transaction which deploys the exploit contract. While regarding the transaction two, because there is a read and write dependence, upon the variable operators. So we will also realize transaction two is also related to this attack. After all the information are collected, we are going to do counterattack synthesis. So specifically, we try to synthesize a counterattack smart contract for each exploit contract. On the left hand side, we show the source code of the exploit contract. Please note that in practice, we do not need the source code. We, ha we have the source code here just for the illustrative purpose. So there is a function hack, which is invoked in the third transaction. 
The function hack will first check whether the message sender is the attacker, and then it will invoke the emergency exit function of the victim contract. Observe that there is indeed some obfuscation there because the emergency exit, emergency exit function does not directly take the parameter to address as the input instead of it use to address plus one. So when the attacker launches the attack, send the third transaction, he needs to carefully craft the parameter as his address minus one. On the right hand side, we show how we construct the counter attack contract. Regarding the, the check regard of the message sender, which here we call counterflow protection, we nullify such kind of check to ensure the counterflow of the counter attack contract is the same as the original exploit contract. Regarding the data obfuscation, we observe that this function call is indeed a call to a benign contract, which is the victim one. So the runtime value of the parameter cannot be obfuscated at that time. What then we directly override the parameter as our address, regardless of the two address. So as a result, we can have a counterattack contract that share the same counterflow while guaranteed the profit are sent to our address. The third phase is to do, okay. The third phase is to locally validate those profits are sent to our account in case we make any mistakes. We evaluate our technique using 86, uh, 86 attack while 24 attacks are out of scope. We successfully synthesize 24, uh, 54 attacks the median runtime overhead is 0.2, while the worst case is 8.5 seconds. We indeed have several limitations. Detailed discussion can be found in our paper. Due to time constraint, I will skip the related work. And that con uh, concludes my presentation. And I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>